coming up next on Small Town Big Deal. We're going to turn this into an heirloom. That's right. We visit the historic factory that turns out historic furniture. Then, holy cow, I just licked my finger. Things get too hot to handle when we go inside the home of the number one pepper sauce in the world. We're going to taste that. And we'll meet a wonderful woman who is never out of her gourds. Welcome to Small Town Big Deal. I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. We are headed to Shelbyville, Indiana. There's a company there that makes a product all made in America that has graced the homes of presidents like FDR and celebrities like Clint Eastwood and Oprah Winfrey. Yeah, they are true craftsmen. And we found out that that product just about never wears out. We're at the Old Hickory Furniture Company. In today's culture of mass production, it remains unique, still building every piece you see here by hand. This is such a cool place. I mean, what's it feel like to get to work here every day? It's fun. We have a lot of things going on. Everything is different every day. Everything is historic. You can't go to a modern day factory and see people making stuff by hand like you see here. These folks are continuing an American handcrafted tradition that's been happening here since 1899. And the company's reputation for quality still travels far from its hometown. Shelbyville is in central Indiana, some 30 miles southeast of Indianapolis. They've kept going through two world wars, the Great Depression, and 18 presidents. It seems this company is about as tough as the wood they make their furniture out of. Why hickory? Hickory is the hardest wood in North America. It was used in early years as wagon wheel spokes. It's such a hard wood. It was used as golf clubs. Babe Ruth used it for his baseball bat when he was hitting all his home runs. And the great thing about our furniture My is... My dad used it to switch me with. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to bring that up. You know, and it got used a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Behind the factory are stacks and stacks of hickory saplings, the raw material for what becomes the company's prized products. The furniture's gonna last and last and last, like the chairs that we see all over the National Park Lodges. In 1906, chairs were shipped to the Old Faithful Inn at Yellowstone, and the same chairs are still there in use today. And these chairs at Craig's Lodge in Colorado are the very ones Old Hickory delivered in 1920. <laughs> and I'm thinking, that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing for the customers. This chair is going to outlive me, my kids, and my grandkids. Not that many repeat customers, though. I don't know whether to say congratulations or I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Here, President Harry Truman's wife, Bess, and her friends enjoy them at Camp David. These durable pieces are made only after being ordered. But today, with just a teeny bit of help, they're letting Rodney and me build one of their popular hoop chairs. Randy, what are we doing now? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pull a chair. I like that phrase, we're going to pull a chair. All right. <laughs> the process begins at the wood pile, Four. picking the pieces needed to create a chair. The back of it's got the big hoop that goes yeah. all the way around the arm, so we need a hoop. We need and we're talking a big piece for the hoop, seven Very feet straight. long Very to be straight. exact. So it's just kind of gentle curve, that's okay. Gentle curve is fine, because we're going to actually bend it okay. all, all the way around. He's, he's going to bend it. He's going to bend it. I <laughs> thought I had Wheaties it. this morning. Okay. <laughs> Before bending the wood, it spends four hours in near boiling water. It's kind of like when you put pasta in the boiling pan. Yes. You do not want it to splash on you. You do not want it to splash. <laughs> it will take your skin off. Wow. Take this out. Lock the lever. Lock it in. Go, Rodney. Go, Rodney. Lock it over. You did it. Woo! Now you just tie it off. He did good. Yeah? Yeah. Next, Rodney evens the legs. Next, we're going to sand. Rodney gets to cut. I just have to push the cart. The bark must be made smooth, but still remain on the wood. Maybe I could put you in there and, you know, kind of get rid of your rough edges. <laughs> You did that on purpose. Ah, now I see the chair. Now you see the chair. And now it's time to stain the wood and wipe it down. 
It looks good. Soon it will look even better as the very talented Marta Jimenez shows us how to weave the back of the chair using nearly a hundred feet of rattan. You think you have to hang out? <laughs> By the end of it. There's no end. There's an end. And you're gonna weave through here, go around and follow the other one. So I can get a chair done like in a month. And Martha can get this back done in about 45 minutes. Oh, 45 minutes. 45 minutes? Yeah. Really? Everything they make is labor intensive, and it's not just chairs. So somebody can actually like sketch something on a piece of paper and say, can you make this for me? Yes. People send it on a napkin. They can email it. They can send it in the mail. As Barb and I worked on finishing our chair, I suddenly realized that Rodney had disappeared. I don't see Rodney. Have you seen him in a while? No, I haven't. Rodney? Have you seen Rodney? I haven't seen him in a long time. Rodney? Have you seen Rodney? Nope, haven't seen him. Hey, a guy can get tired after all that work. And these chairs are so comfortable. He got the furniture. You're sleeping on the job. I got the last few steps done. Hey, if they didn't make such comfortable chairs. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Did you do this? This is nice. Do we ask Randy if it's sellable? Well, not quite yet because we still got to put the brass tag on it. Hey, success. Success, you got one. We do got an order for about a thousand chairs coming through. You want to stay around? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, you look comfortable. That's good. On behalf of Old Hickory, we want to give you guys this chair. <gasps> Since you made it from start to finish, wow. we want to give you this chair. What's Jan going to get? <laughs> well. I knew that was coming. Who are told that an Old Hickory Hoop chair can go for as much as a thousand dollars. But we like to think ours is priceless because we'll always have a story to tell about how we helped make it. Yeah, I thought it was going to go to my house first. No, it's going to go to my house first, isn't it? Isn't it going to go to my house first? And coming up next, one red hot story. You just let it sit on the front of your tongue? You told me that a little late. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. We got a story that's gonna spice up your life. It's about a product that is known the world over. Yeah, it's made right here by the same family since right after the Civil War. But the recipe is basically the same and it's more popular than ever. It's sold in 187 countries and its label is printed in 22 different languages. And for nearly 150 years, every pepper grown and every bottle that's made has its roots here, Avery Island, Louisiana, the home of Tabasco. You know, it all started with my great-great-grandfather, Edmund McElhenney, who was a banker from New Orleans. As the direct descendant of the man who created Tabasco, CEO Tony Simmons has red pepper sauce running through his veins. I'm the current steward of what we do. My family's done this for 148 years. And what the McElhenney family has done is achieve nothing less than world hot sauce and domination. For anyone alive today, Tabasco has always been number one. But its beginnings were far more humble. Banker Edmund McElhenney had lost everything during the Civil War. So, trying to rebuild his life, he set out to sell bottles of his homemade hot sauce. So, he began to take it to New Orleans and sell it. He got a dollar a bottle at that time in 1866, 1867. That's got to be a lot of money in That was a lot of money back then. These are all the seed plants that originated from your great-great-grandpa's chicken coop? That's right. Every Tabasco plant that we use to make our pepper from comes from that one plant. So it is an heirloom seed. So this is our Tabasco pepper plant. Tony walks us through rows of Tabasco peppers that can be traced back to Edmund's lone surviving chicken coop plant. Be very careful what you touch after you yeah. do this because it, it does come on your hands. Holy cow, I just licked my finger. Uh-oh. Is it hot? Yeah! <laughs> it's gonna be hot. You measure the heat in food in what they call Scoville units. Regular red Tabasco has a Scoville unit rating of between 2,500 and 5,000. This pepper has a Scoville rating of between 25,000 and 50,000 Scoville units. So it's 10 times, 
It's 10 times as hot as what's in the bottle. So once we pick these, we're going to grind it up into a mash, and we're going to add some salt to it, and then we're going to put it in barrels, and we're going to age it for up to three years. We want the pepper to sit through two hot summers at Avery Island. So you make it sweat before it makes us sweat. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, Jan. We sure do. Next stop, the warehouse, where up to 50,000 barrels of all that mash is kept. They're covered in salt to lock in the flavor. So are you all ready to taste a little bit of our mash? Oh, wow. Uh, he's, he's done that a time or two. Tony has one of the guys pop open a barrel of brand new mash. Woo! I can smell that wow. already. We're going to taste that? So that's fresh. And then one that's been aged for three years. Wow. It's ten times as hot as what's in the bottle. Did he just say ten times as hot and we're going to do a taste test? I'm not too good with hot food. Yeah, just let it sit on the front of your tongue and, and then... You told me that front of the tongue a little late. <laughs> it already got to the back. I hope I don't regret this. It stays with you. Yeah, the burn will last a while. You know, at 40,000 Scoville units. Okay, I'm sorry, there is just no ladylike way to spit. You taste oh, yeah. the salt, you get a little bit of salt out on the edges, and then the heat comes late at the yeah, back the of your tongue. Mm-hmm, exactly. Yeah. That tastes good. Yeah. That's just hot. <laughs> I mean, there is a big is difference. A big this is more mature, more kind mature. of like, more sophisticated. Yes, it is. Yeah. Still hot. It's still hot. Well, <laughs> really hot. You can be mature and still be hot. I'm just saying. <laughs> just saying, huh? <laughs> I was throwing a compliment your way. There you go. These are all mixing vats here. Once three years has passed, the mash goes to the blending room. There, it's put into 2,000 gallon white oak vats where it's mixed with distilled vinegar for 28 days. Every bottle of Tabasco in the world is produced here at Avery Island, up to about 700,000 bottles a day. A day? A day. And while Avery Island now boasts everything from a Tabasco museum to a country store full of the hottest merchandise, Tabasco spam. The one thing that has never and will never change is the McElhenney family's dedication to its roots. We're tasting the pepper mash. We oh. induct you into the not so ancient order of the not so silver spoon. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. For showing courage under fire. That is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. It's our badge of honor. I like badge it. Of honor. And coming up next, the woman who is lovingly called Look at that. the gourd lady. Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. You know, what we love is highlighting on this show unique places, people, and products. <laughs> Today, I think we're going to hit all three of those. And especially the people part. Meet Helen Thomas, known as the Gourd Lady. She grows thousands each year on her Indiana farm, so she'll never be, you know, out of her gourds. First thing I want to know is, what exactly is a gourd? Well, some people think it's something that you can play music on. <laughs> you can. And other people think it's a container. <laughs> like these. Some people think it's a canvas that you can paint on. And not just paint them, but carve them into just about anything. <laughs> a bear. My wolf. I think a wolf. Ricola. But first, Helen has to grow them. Oh, wow. Look at that. See, that's a female. That came off a of female. Wow. Helen's farm is in Tangier, Indiana, near the Illinois border, some 90 miles west of Indianapolis. Helen's history with gourds goes back some 30 years. She and her husband, Ron, were already farmers, but her nephew helped them switch crops. He came home from school, and he actually had two boxes of seeds, $15, and I thought, he'll never get them sold, so I will buy them. So I bought both boxes off of him for $30. And you had been growing gourds before that? No, we were watermelon farmers. I threw in this little row of gourds out of that package. Well, Ron began to get mad. He didn't want those gourds out in the watermelon field. Yeah, they're cutting down on his watermelon profits. <laughs> right, it was. One row quickly became a quarter of an acre. And that's when a couple of tourists, who happened to be artists, changed Helen's life. So they stopped, and, and they wanted to buy like $2,500 worth of those. Well, oh and all of a sudden, your husband said, you can take my whole watermelon field. You got it. And now folks come from all over to buy Helen's gourds and visit what she calls Sand Lady Farm. 
So I want to know, how did you get the name Sand Lady, though? See that sand? Our soil's sandy. That's why I'm called Sand Lady. And every spring, she plants seedlings in that soil, believe it or not, using this antique rig. Look at that! Uh-huh. Only female blossoms produce gourds, but they need the help of pollen from the male blossoms. Helen can't always count on bees, so pollinating is often her job. And do you want to pollinate, Rodney? Yeah. yeah. That's a male blossom. Open that up and take some of that pollen and put it right there on that, and that's what's called pollinating. Get a big kiss. Okay. Well, you're a little, a little rough with her. Once harvested, Helen washes the gourds. She used to do it all by hand before inventing this giant washing tub. That's really high pressure right now. Yeah. You could probably cut your finger if you got really? it. Really? Yeah. You want to dry it? No. Cleaned and dried, they're ready for the artist. Like these members of the Indiana Gourd Society. This purple paisley work won Diane Wardlow best in show at the Indiana State Fair. How would you describe Helen? Well, she's all heart. She knows more about gourds than I'm ever going to learn. She shares everything she's got, and she's just big heart. And Diane shared with us a kind of entry-level lesson in gourd art, known as marbleizing. Dip it quick. Oh, dip it quick. Do a spin. Make sure you get that spin, Jan. And push it down. Push it down. And pull it back up. And we'll see what we got. Hey! hey. There you go. That's pretty good. Isn't that cool? I could never do that. In and down and twist and catch. Oh, I don't think I did as good as you. <laughs> okay, Jans, Rodney's. He wins. Rodney, you are artistic. Yeah, but we still won't earn a place in Helen's museum. Yep, she even has a gourd museum on our farm. All these pieces you see were done with gourds she grew. Gourd art is serious stuff. This piece here is the work of Denny Wainscott, now considered the country's top gourd artist. 20 years ago, he was winning ribbons at the Indiana State Fair. Now what would a piece like this be worth? This one here, uh, when he's back in that day, this was a $700 piece. Wow. When he first started coming here, he would always say, Helen, I'm gonna go big time someday. I will be in the galleries. And he has gotten, I think, a little over 20,000. I heard that the first thing you ever painted is in here. Yeah, it is. Oh, so you carved it, or what? Bur That's wood, wood burning. Wood burned it. Good How much job. you want for it? Oh, I'd probably be like Denny and take uh, maybe twenty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Helen is indeed a true character with true character. Stop by and see for yourself, because everybody's welcome at her personal field of dreams. I love these people. I love the people. I, my customers. They're like my family. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Small Town Big Deal. You know, I do love to craft and make things with my hands, so I'm going to have to give gourd art a try now, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> well, while you're crafting, I'm going to be thinking of dishes to put that hot sauce on. Okay, that mash, though, my mouth is still on fire. How about yours? That was really hot. Yeah, I'm glad they offer a mild version for <laughs> wimps like me. Yeah, wow. And before we end this episode, though, Mr. Miller, I have one question for you. Hey, what is that? Where's the chair? I'm Rodney Miller. He's not going to answer me, is he? I'm Jan Cara. Join us again next week when once again we celebrate the great stories from across America. I thought we were going to, like, share the chair. You thought that? Yeah. Seriously. Oh, my gosh. It looks really good. What do you think? Wait, wait, now, wait. Here's the test. Could... Where were you? Oh, <laughs> Uh, technical difficulties. <laughs> he was asleep. And I, when am I going to hurt this? He's watching snakes not walking through. <laughs> ah, he hates snakes. Oh, is that about snakes?